uh, and now is, as is fitting given the foundations of our curriculum, our first panel discussion uh, takes us to questions of political philosophy and debates and discussions among great minds and across centuries about the question, what is a citizen? Uh, in relation to great ideas and sources about these kinds of questions, uh, stay tuned for what's happening over on this side of the room. Uh, by lunchtime, we should have a few uh, samples from our civic classics collection. We hope you can stay to see them. Among them will be a first edition of the Federalist from 1788. And toward the end of the collection, we will have an inscribed copy of Martin Luther King Jr.'s first book, Stride Toward Freedom. And we have some other items from the uh, collection here as well. So now it is my delight to introduce, introduce the chair of our first panel. Catherine Zuckert is the Reeves Drew Professor of Political Science Emeritus from the University of Notre Dame. And we are delighted that she is a visiting professor in our school uh, each spring, at least she has been l last year and this year, and we hope to have her uh, back again along with uh, Michael Zuckert. I'll just mention the titles of a few of her books, Natural Right and the American Imagination, Political Philosophy in Novel Form, Plato's Philosophers, The Coherence of the Dialogues. Her most recent monograph is Machiavelli's Politics. She also co-authored two books with Michael Zuckert, The Truth About Leo Strauss and Leo Strauss and the Problem of Political Philosophy. She's edited or co-edited several other books and she served for many years as the editor of a leading journal of political philosophy, The Review of Politics. And she also was and is a founding member of the Academic Advisory Board for our school. Please join me in welcoming Catherine Zuckert. So you're lucky I'm just moderating, not writing, because you'd be here for an age. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce the three eminent scholars who will be uh, presenting three of the classic answers to the question, what is a citizen? Uh, first, Susan Collins, who is an associate professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, she is author of a very fine study of Aristotle and the rediscovery of citizenship, as well as a translator with Robert Bartlett of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics. So in sum, she knows what she's talking about. Michael Zuckert, as you just heard, is uh, a visiting professor here in Skettle for this semester. And he is, as I, um, an emeritus professor at the University of Notre Dame. He's published extensively on both early and modern political philosophy and American political thought. He will be defending the Lockean version of liberal citizenship from the Aristotelian, I don't know, right or left, and the Rousseauian, same question. Um, last, but by no means least, Clifford Orwin will present um, an account of Rousseau's critique of both Aristotelian and Lockean understandings of citizenship. Um, Orwin is a professor of political science at the University of Toronto. He's a well-known scholar of political philosophy, but he also dabbles, or more than dabbles, in contemporary politics. He regularly writes for two Canadian newspapers, the Mail on the Globe and the National Post. Uh, and I hope you will welcome them. Thank you. Good afternoon or good morning. I'm not, it's still morning, I guess. Um, it's something of a cruelty to have to follow Rich Lowry's speech on um, nationalism, wonderful speech on nationalism, but maybe the title of my talk will give you some hope. Aristotle on Citizenship, a guide to the good life. This title, I am aware, sounds vaguely, or not so vaguely perhaps, like the title of a self-help book, and so may not seem to do justice to Aristotle's great works of philo political philosophy, though they could well be characterized as self-help books in a much deeper and more profound way than the slew of such books today. I would also add that my title promises more than it will be able to deliver. Originally, I had taken my task um, for the panel as simply to provide Aristotle's answer to the question of the panel's own title, what is a citizen? But then I realized that the write-up for the panel had already provided the answer. According to Aristotle, it states, 
Citizenship is membership in a political community that entails duties and responsibilities and requires dedication to a common good that benefits the individual and the community as a whole. This is an answer that is a fair enough thumbnail of Aristotle's view. So then I decided that either I just shouldn't show up, my task having been completed, or that I should take this clear and straightforward ans version of Aristotle's answer to the question, what is a citizen, and bring out dimensions of this answer that would illustrate its richness and complexity. And this will be tough, uh, but I don't want to give a mere summary account of Aristotle's question to this, uh, answer to this question, which is a danger when one is asked to give a short talk on it. Uh, when I was doing a master's degree, lo, so many years ago, decades ago, I was a teaching assistant for a um, survey course in the history of political thought. And the man teaching the course I would describe as a sort of old time liberal. And I noticed that he didn't have Aristotle uh, listed on his syllabus. And I wondered whether it was because Aristotle had somehow offended his liberal sensibilities. But when I asked him why Aristotle wasn't on the syllabus, his answer was that in survey courses, you have to summarize great thinkers. And it had been his experience over the years that when you summarize Aristotle, he ends up sounding like an idiot. <laughs> and that, he said, he wanted nothing to do with, even though, he added, he believed Aristotle to be wrong in almost every essential. <laughs> so first and foremost, then, I would like to fulfill my assigned task in a way that does not make Aristotle sound like an idiot. And I seek to do this by bringing out, as far as possible in the time allotted, Aristotle's view of the significance of civic or political life for our happiness. Hence, my main aim is to bring out the nobility and goodness of civic life, the morally virtuous life that we find so richly treated in Aristotle's two great works of political philosophy, his Nicomachean Ethics and Politics, and to show how this life is intimately connected with our happiness as human beings. But in concluding my talk, I would like to point to a facet of Aristotle's treatment of this question of happiness that is frequently puzzling especially to modern readers and perhaps in its own right. And that is his distinction between the political life, the life of the citizen, and the contemplative life, the life that he observes in his politics is separated from the city, that is from politics and the political community, and that he ranks in his ethics as the best life for a human being. So I raise this question in conclusion to ask how it bears on what is otherwise a very compelling picture of the significance of civic life and civic action for our happiness. And in this uh, connection, I seek also to um, indicate what Aristotle's account of citizenship and happiness illuminates regarding certain current presuppositions on the matter. So on the one hand, Aristotle's robust account of citizenship helps us to see how our own separation of public duty and private happiness is in error how our happiness is of a piece with activities oriented toward the common good. So Aristotle's account thereby, I think, helps to restore a sense of the worthiness of civic activity from the point of view of happiness and the goodness and even the pleasures that attend it. On the other hand, I suggest Aristotle also indicates that at some level or in some sense, the separation we make between public duty and private happiness may be correct since the political community, and hence the actions in relation to it, may not be wholly deserving or the best object of our devotion. We may be political animals, to use his famous term. If you know anything about Aristotle, you know that term. For, uh, for whom the activities of citizenship both educate us and reflect a completion or perfection of our nature, our human nature, especially, he would say, in justice and prudence. But as is well known, Aristotle calls the political life second best with respect to the human good and happiness, the theoretical or philosophical life being the best. And so I'd like to shed some light on the meaning and significance of the ra this ranking of the two ways of life, which are the two chosen, he says, by those who are most ambitious with respect to virtue. It would be difficult, I believe, to outdo Aristotle's account of the dignity and nobility of the life of the good citizen. 
The nobility of this life is drawn in fine lines and rich colors in the account in the Nicomachean Ethics of the 11 virtues from courage to justice that form its moral core and that find their peak or a peak in Aristotle's account of justice, which he defines as the sum of all the virtues oriented toward the good of another. The account also points us to the completion of moral virtue in prudence or practical reason, the intellectual virtue that makes it possible for the morally virtuous to perceive in each circumstance what the right thing to do is in the right way, Aristotle's famous formulation. Aristotle presents these virtues, these moral virtues, as goods in their own right, since they perfect us, and as goods from the point of view of the political community. And perhaps the noblest among these virtues is the first virtue that Aristotle discusses in the ethics, courage, the virtue that pertains to fear and confidence. For courage disposes us correctly toward our fear of the most terrible thing, death. And in doing so, makes possible the noblest action in risking death in battle. Yet the other virtues also perfect us in rightly disposing our appetites and passions, and each in its own way attains or makes possible what Aristotle tells us is the end or telos of virtue, tokalon, the noble or the beautiful. Moderation, for example, may be hard, very hard for human beings, given that the appetites or desires, as he says, are insatiable and come from every side, and so need constant chastening. But one can see the goodness of such chastening simply by reflecting on the worst extreme or vice, licentiousness, which Aristotle makes clear carries its own pain associated with the, the need to satisfy untamed and so great desires, and which permits the appetites to rule over reason, thereby obstructing good, good action and noble action. Liberality or generosity disposes us in the right way towards actions that have to do with the giving and spending of money, the nobility of which we can see in reflecting on the powerful love of money and the vice of stinginess. Machiavelli may say that if one must be generous, find a way to use other people's money. But for Aristotle, it is in part the loss one suffers in using one's own that contributes to generosity's nobility. Magnificence is the virtue that pertains to great wealth directed toward the great and noble actions of the common good. For example, dare I say, the endowing of a school of civic and economic thought and leadership. <laughs> Aristotle's account of the other virtues similarly illuminates the ways in which they tame and refine our appetites and passions and make us capable of living well in relation to our fellow citizens and friends. When it comes to the concern with the common good, however, justice is the greatest of the virtues. So great, he tells us, that it is held to be more wondrous than the morning or the evening star. For the one who possesses the virtue of justice possesses all the virtues summed up and oriented toward the good of another. The just person in this complete sense has been formed by the law and is lawful, acting with the view to the good of the community as a whole and certainly never taking more than his or her, her fair share of the common goods. The good judge, Aristotle also tells us, is or wishes to be the just in soul, aiming always at the correct mean with respect to distributive and corrective justice, thereby securing and preserving the rule of law understood as correct reason. And in this respect, Aristotle points us to the great difficulty of knowing what the just and unjust things are, or at least knowing how to apply them in order to benefit another. So this is to say that however wondrous the moral virtues are, they are yet virtues acquired by habituation and issuing from habit. So this fact does not, I think, de devalue the sense in which these virtues are indeed goods of the soul, 
Aristotle's account powerfully brings out how habituation is necessary in shaping our appetites, passions, and actions and making them good. But this account also promises, too, that the moral virtues are finally underlaid by correct reason, and hence raises the question of what that correct reason is by dint of which the virtues are truly virtues. So since uh, Aristotle's account of correct reason is very complex on this reason, I won't even, on this, uh, for this, on this question, I won't even dare to summarize because Aristotle will go from being an idiot to being a total moron. I would make only the following part, point. However impressive a virtue justice is, Aristotle points to prudence as the virtue of the good citizen understood as one who holds ruling office. For the realm of politics is the realm of action that aims at the human good, and prudence is the virtue that pertains not simply to one's own good, but more importantly to the common good and the needs or necessities that bear on the community as a whole. And as such, the demands of citizenship are considerable because they involve prudential judgment about what is advantageous or harmful, just or unjust, to, in, to use the well-worn metaphor, guiding the ship of state. And these demands are always in play but especially evident in perilous times when the very security and honor of the community is at stake. So one thinks naturally of the virtues of a Washington in the Revolutionary Period, or a Lincoln in the Civil War, a Churchill or FDR in the Second World War. In our current setting, one thinks of the very virtues of mind and character that this school of civic and economic thought and leadership seeks to cultivate and that are, we are much in urgent need of. And it is in this sense that Aristotle says in his politics that the good man and the morally serious citizen are the same in the one who rules in the best regime. So the nobility and greatness of the moral virtues and especially justice and prudence are thus intimately connected with their orientation towards securing and preserving the good of the the political community over and above that of any individual good. And prudence in particular is the virtue that makes it possible for the virtuous leader to, preserve, to perceive what the right thing to do and in the right way in, and, and at, what, at the right time under the circumstances. And what's at stake is thus considerable and Aristotle treats the matter with the dignity and the, the gravity it deserves. At the beginning, of both the ethics and the politics, Aristotle underscores the importance of the political community and hence the serious nature of the political art. As is well known in the opening chapters of the, his politics, he asserts the naturalness of this community in being the end or telos of the original impulse of human beings for, for the good and living well. So from this point of view, we attain the good and live well only in the political community properly constituted, and this same community becomes the object of our devotion and action. So by presenting so robust a picture of the political life, the life of the citizen, attentive to the greatness and nobility of its object, Aristotle's answer to the question, what is a citizen, thus acts as something of a corrective to our own disposition to think of this life as one of public duty separated from the question of our individual happiness as human beings. For he helps us to see or to recollect how the political life and its virtues are consequential for that happiness, both in its own right for us as citizens in acting and faring well, and for the sake of the good of all in common. Indeed, when he says at the beginning of the politics, this remarkable line that the one who first constituted the political community is the cause of the greatest goods. We can say that this is true in two senses, that he or she performs the best of actions possible for a human being and achieves the greatest good for all. But herein lies something of a puzzle, for it is well known to anyone who has read Aristotle's Ethics and Politics that he also argues that there's another way of life, the theoretical or contemplative way of life, the activity of which, he says, 
ultimately is superior to the actions involved in citizenship. Now one could say this is just Aristotle's bias as a philosopher, but I think he gives reasons for this. That Aristotle makes this kind of separation between the actions of civic life as serious and as noble as they are and other activities that we cherish as good may not seem for us on the face of it to be overly disturbing. We are disposed, as I mentioned, to make the same kind of separation between our public duties and our private happiness. Yet I suspect that we would not rank the theoretical life so highly as Aristotle does, or per perhaps not even at all, dare I say, at a university. First and most obviously, we in principle leave this question of the best life for a human being open, insisting either that the good or happiness is entirely a matter for the individual, or that the good is plural, and hence that there's a variety of ways of life that may qualify as happy. So here too, our separation between what is required of us as citizens and what makes us happy is at play given our divide between public and private. But I would add that because we make this separation, we obscure not only the significance of civic life and its actions for our happiness, our individual happiness, but also what is at stake in Aristotle's ranking of the two ways of life, which, as he notes in both the ethics and politics, are in competition with one another when it comes to the question of the good life and human happiness. So in conclusion then, I would like to suggest the following as a way of thinking of Aristotle's, I think, distinctive approach to this matter, if only to help us make sense of why he presents these two ways of life and their distinctive actions in competition with one another. First, these lives are in competition, but not wholly in opposition to one another. The life of the citizen is not simply one of action, but of thought, the anoia, and the precision and complexity with which the prudent leader, the truly prudent leader, goes about his or her work is made clear not only in Aristotle's discussion of prudence in his ethics, but in the whole of that work and in the, its counterpart, the politics. Indeed, Aristotle insists in more than one place that prudential judgment is not, and here I have to apologize to the ambitious young students in the audience, it is not a young person's game. Given both the time it takes to become fully virtuous, fully formed in accord with justice and the moral virtues, but also the time it takes to gain the experience in life and its necessities that must be acquired for one to make the right judgment in the right way, at the right time, in the right circumstances. Moreover, Aristotle presents prudence as a, perf as a perfection of one part of the soul and hence as self-sufficient and possessed of its own principles of action. And since those principles accord with reason or correct reason, he indicates that the political and theoretical lives are not obviously or necessarily in opposition to one another. It may be the case that these perfections are of a piece with one another in being the perfection of the rational part of the soul. Nevertheless, he does, and I'll end with this, present these two lives as requiring a choice. In his politics, he presents them as the lives that the most ambitious with respect to virtue choose, but about which there is also a dispute. And there's much to say about this dispute what especially would be the ground or grounds of its resolution, but I wanna suggest the following in closing. Aristotle's presentation of this choice preserves the impressive worthiness of the life of the citizen, the life devoted to the city's affairs and the common good. He also tasks his readers, however, to think through the question of whether or not there is an activity, an action that's yet better and that deserves therefore to be held in higher esteem. As wondrous as justice may be, more wondrous some say than the evening or morning star, he notes in his discussion of prudence in book six of the politics that there may be things, quote, whose nature is more divine than that of a human being. To take only the most manifest example, he adds, the things of which the cosmos is composed. 
And in presenting the choice of these two lives, Aristotle presents something of a conundrum for both his ancient and his modern readers, a conundrum well worth trying to resolve. But I will end just by saying that I think that he also seeks to preserve what is highest in both ways of life, the activity of thinking and the worthiness of the objects at which our thought and actions are directed. Thank you. Uh, greetings, everybody. Um, I just want to uh, j jump right into it um, by observing that I think the very existence of this conference indicates some degree of dissatisfaction with our current experience of citizenship. Now, there are several different strains of thought or strains of dissatisfaction, I think, in our con with our contemporary, that is to say, liberal citizenship. And I would like to begin my talk by tracing one of those strains of discontent, that I, one that I think is actually quite common. So the version that I want to talk about uh, received a uh, an, uh, a public statement fairly recently in a book by my former Notre Dame colleague, Patrick Deneen, a book called Why Liberalism Failed. Um, his approach in this book has a very clear focus and a, one that's particularly suitable for our panel. Uh, liberalism, he argues, has failed, witness his title. It's failed in practice, um, but the practical failure of liberalism, he argues, was foreordained by the shortcomings of liberal theory, which preceded the practice and, in his telling, laid down the blueprint, so to speak, for the liberal societies that followed. He has a dominating theme in his presentation of liberal theory that I think captures his uh, critique extremely well and captures it in one word, that word being individualism. The chief problems with liberal citizenship, he argues, derives from the overly individualistic character of liberal society, and that in turn derives from what he, like many others, calls, hold on to your hats, the ontological individualism of liberal political theory. Now, the tenor of his assessment of this liberal practice of citizenship is captured in his judgment that this liberal citizenship generates a civic catastrophe. That's a quotation. He doesn't, but he could cite such facts as the relatively low participation rates by American citizens in something like voting. For example, in the 2016 election, which was an election with a comparatively high voter turnout, just 55% of the eligible voters actually went to the polls. This compares rather unfavorably with, let's say, the 80% of the Danish citizens who went to the polls in a recent election or the 75% of Israeli and German voters who regularly vote in their elections. Now, since voting is often thought to be the chief duty or privilege of citizenship, the fact that barely more than half of the potential voters bothered to show up in an election that was clearly important to the future of the country. So um, we might take this as an indication of some sort of citizenship deficit if not quite a civic disaster or catastrophe. But Deneen and many like-minded critics tend to see the relative lack of interest in voting as only a surface manifestation of the real problem. Americans, they argue, are relatively indifferent to voting because they are relatively indifferent to the public dimension of our common life. The American founders set out, uh, says Mr. Deneen, to create a republic a word and a concept deriving from the Latin term res publica, which literally means the public thing, the public thing. A republic is a public thing where the citizens are oriented toward, loyal to, active in, devoted to the good of that public thing. Deneen and other like-minded critics of liberal citizenship find these commitments and loyalties to be anemic, to say the least, in America today. American liberal citizens, they say, are far more devoted to, to the private things that are their own, their own lives, their private circles, their careers, their success or failure in their careers, their own good 
and the good of those who are near and dear to them, but not to the public good. They lack, Deneen might say, a robust citizenship. Liberal citizenship on this account is thin citizenship. Now, since a popular or a people's government, such as a republic, depends on the activities of its citizens to keep it healthy, Deneen concludes that we are witnessing the portents of liberalism's end times. These portents appear, he argues, in the degraded character of our citizenship. Now, Deneen uh, sees these deleterious results of the liberal order to be inherent in the liberal order itself and not to be accidental results of some external uh, events or, or features. Some of the bad results were due, he says, to a very conscious aim and policies of the liberal political order itself, or its founders anyway. So he argues that James Madison and the other American founders consciously aimed, and this is a quotation, to inculcate civic indifference and privatism among the citizenry. The founders sought, he says, to render the citizenry relatively powerless and in the public realm, and therefore inclined to focus their attention uh, um, on achievable private aims and ends. At the same time, he argues, the founders encouraged liberation from interpersonal ties and connections, fostering mistrust toward others so that interpersonal relations would be tenuous, fleeting, and fungible. In other words, he argues, the originators of the liberal order sought to thin out the private realm at least as much as they sought to weaken the public thing. Now, according to Deneen, it is not that the liberal founders were bad men or that they aimed to harm their fellow countrymen. Rather, they were captured by a false and problematic ontology, as he puts it, or anthropology. Behind the liberal founders stood the early modern philosophers who dreamed up the liberal order and put it on very defective foundations. Our contemporary ills, he argues, are mainly the working out of the defective foundations on which thinkers like John Locke built their philosophic systems. Now, Deneen and similar critics have in mind an old and familiar story of the founding and nature of political societies. Students in the Skettle program, I'm sure, are familiar with this. I hope the rest of you are, too. Um, this philosophy begins by positing human beings as originally in a state of nature that is existing naturally as isolated, complete in themselves, individuals. This is what Deneen means by that phrase, ontological individualism. What is real, what has genuine status, is the individual. Society and human sociality, according to this account, are artifices, constructions, fabrications, made by human beings for narrow utilitarian purposes, such as peace or comfort. Society is a result of a so-called social contract. According to Deneen, liberal theory begins with the rejection of the Aristotelian dictum that you just heard about, that human beings are political animals who find their completion and their flourishing only in political association. Beginning with the notion that the human reality are individuals hostile or at best indifferent to each other, it is no wonder, Deneen avers, that the political order that these individuals create produces a theory and a practice of citizenship so thin as to threaten us with civic catastrophe because political life becomes matter of all rights, that is, my claims against society and no duties, that is, what I owe to society. Now, my aim from here is to contest this anti-liberal account. A proper response would be book length. I have a book here, I mean, if you wanna, it's all in here, but I'm not gonna present it all. Um, <laughs> but I do wanna focus on two dimensions of this, uh, of this critique. First, and I think most importantly, I want to contest the anti-liberal construal of the state of nature as presented by the liberal philosophers. And second, I want to contest, uh, very briefly, the thin theory of liberal citizenship as all or mostly rights and no or few duties. 
Now, I'm going to speak only about the state of nature theory of John Locke and not the theory, for example, of Thomas Hobbes or uh, Rousseau, uh, about whom I suspect you may hear a little later. Um, uh, but Locke is, I think, the most important of the state of nature thinkers for the uh, American experience, and therefore he seems most suitable to uh, talk about here. Now, Deneen is, of course, correct to begin his statement by calling attention to the fact that Locke's political philosophy does, in fact, contain an account of a so-called state of nature. Indeed, that is the title of the very first substantive chapter in Locke's uh, main book on politics. Now, contrary to what Deneen and his follow fellow anti-liberal thinkers believe, however, the state of nature is not meant by Locke to be a depiction of the historically original condition of human beings, nor is it meant to be an account of the true nature of human beings, what he would call the ontological reality of humanity. It's not meant to be an ontological account of humanity. It is somewhat surprising that Locke's state of nature is so often interpreted in these erroneous ways because he is quite clear about the purpose and bearing of his account of the state of nature. He introduces the idea of the state of nature in order to help elucidate what political power is, which is the main uh, first topic anyway of his major book. As he makes clear in his definition of political power, this power is characterized, as he puts it, by the right of those who possess it to make laws to make laws with penalties of death and all lesser penalties. All of this for the sake of securing rights and the protection of society. What distinguishes the political from all other forms of human relations of which Locke speaks in, the, in his book is precisely this right to use force or coercion even unto death. Lockean liberal theory then begins as an attempt to discern what, if anything, justifies the possession of rightful power or authority to coerce others. He wants to discover where, the power, where this power comes from and whether it is legitimate. The existence of coercion, Locke implies, is problematical. It requires justification. As Locke also saw, the basis for justifying rightful coercion, coercive power will also tell us what the proper uh, scope, extent, and purpose of this legitimate coercive authority might be. Human beings are not, as a matter of course, as a background assumption of his thought, rightfully subject to coercion by others. We all recognize the use of coercion against innocence as somehow an injustice or a crime. Locke models or depicts this aspect of human beings in his state of nature as a state in which no one has dominion or sovereignty over any other person. No one has natural authority to use coercion, especially not to kill another. That is what and only what the state of nature is meant to signify and represent. That is the extent of the individualism affirmed in the Lockean state of nature. But what might be the basis of this general immunity against coercion that Locke affirms with his doctrine of the state of nature? Well, his answer is clear. Human beings possess rights, rights to life and liberty and property. Now, one of the curious aspects of Locke's political philosophy is that he calls these named rights and all rights, he calls them all property. He does this because he wants to emphasize one aspect of rights that the term property captures extremely well. Something belonging to Carol cannot rightfully be seized by Peter, destroyed, impeded, or harmed by him without the consent of Carol. To capture this idea, Locke identifies human beings as self-owners. That is, they have this property right in themselves that gives them a moral immunity against the coercive acts by others. To take another's property without that own the owner's consent is a crime. So is the use of coercion on the body of another person. And this, by the way, is where Locke differs from Hobbes, because Hobbes says that by nature, people have a right 
to everything, including one another's bodies. Locke denies that. So the state of nature models the fact that the existence of coercion is a problem requiring justification, and he clarifies that the reason for this is that human beings by nature have rights or that they have natural rights. This affirmation does not commit liberal theory to the view that these rights-bearing individuals do not live in families or villages or cities or nations. The state of nature is merely the affirmation that all men are created equal in the sense that none naturally has the right to rule or coerce another and that the ground of that right to coerce, so far as it exists, must be uncovered. Locke makes this perfectly clear when he defines political power, the object of his inquiry, as a right, not a mere brute, brute fact, but a right. The state of nature is a device to discover the moral basis and limits of political authority. Given its character and point, it should be clear that the affirmation of the state of nature does not commit liberalism to the thin theory of citizenship, as Deneen and others claim. Indeed, the evidence of both liberal theory and liberal practice suggests otherwise. The citizens of a Lockean state are not the merely private individuals pursuing their own self-interest as is depicted in this anti-liberal theory. But each citizen, according to Locke, is rather obliged to lend his force to the community's authorities in order to keep peace and good order and to serve the public good. As Locke says, political power exists only for the public good. And each citizen is a servant of that public good. Contrary to what is otherwise uh, often thought of liberal citizenship, citizens have the duty, according to Locke, to come to the aid of the community's authorities in the defense of the society against internal and external threats to it. Fighting in the wars of one's country is not a contradiction of liberal citizenship, as anti-liberals claim, but a fulfillment of it. Now, none of this is to say that there are no differences between liberal and illiberal pre-liberal citizenship. Since the point of liberal theory is to demand a justification for the exercise of coercion, there are many potential uses of state power that cannot be justified and therefore must be left free, according to liberal theory. Historically, the most important of these concern religion. Since liberal thought emerged in some large part in response to and as an effort to tame the religious conflicts of post-Reformation Europe, it is no surprise that it declares religion mostly off limits to state power. But it is not these historical circumstances alone that account for liberalism's arm's length approach to religion. As thinkers like Locke approached the question of religion, they found on analysis that there was no rational justification for the state or any other, uh, or any other agent to deploy coercion in the religious sphere. That is to say, in regard to the relations between humankind and God or gods, liberal societies are thus, in principle, open to a kind of pluralism of religions and, consequently, many other matters as well. All of this tends to render the uh, liberal society less, solidari less solidaristic, eh, solidaristic, is that a word? Anyway, less solidaristic than societies marked by more uniformity. It is that lesser solidarity that has led illiberal critics to miss the, thin, the thickness that in reality does or can characterize liberal citizenship. It is thick in that the citizens owe much to their society, even their lives at the end of the day, but it is limited in that the citizens are to be free for self-rule and self-determination in large swaths of their lives. Thank you. I seem to have been the speaker who had the most difficulty getting here. I arrived only in the middle of Mr. Lowry's speech after a long and eventful nocturnal journey. I'm extremely happy to be here because I've always regarded the founding of Skettle as one of the most encouraging recent developments in modern 
recent developments in American higher education, and it's an honor to have been invited to participate in one of its events. The theme of our panel is citizenship, and my task is to expound the version of it offered by Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Citizenship is as old as the ancient Greeks and Romans and some other ancient peoples, and Rousseau sought inf inspiration from these. Even so, his treatment of citizenship is emphatically modern or up-to-date. It is so in two respects. First, it rests on a fully modern understanding of human nature, which for want of time, I won't try to explain here, although I will in the longer production that is um, expected um, from each of the panelists. I will say, though, that that understanding of human nature is not less but more radically individualistic than that of Rousseau's predecessors. And yet, in Rousseau's case, that very greater radical individualism lead, yields a much stronger notion of citizenship. And again, I'll try to explain that connection um, in, my, in my essay. The second way in which Rousseau's treatment of citizenship is emphatically modern is that he offers it as a response to what he regarded as the distinctively modern political problem. And this was the problem posed by the impending triumph of liberal individualism. I say impending triumph because Rousseau did not live to see the founding of a modern liberal regime. At his death in 1778, the American Revolution still hovered on the brink of failure. Nor could anyone have predicted with confidence its outcome, even if successful. Rousseau knew liberal individualism only through the writings of such theoretical proponents of it as Hobbes, Locke, and Montesquieu, and through Montesquieu's and other accounts of the practices of England and Holland, pre-liberal societies in transition to liberalism. Despite such limited exposure, so incisive was Rousseau's critique of the new liberal world of mourning that it has served as the basis of almost all subsequent ones. One way of putting that is that Rousseau is the theoretical founder of the modern left. A central aspect of this critique was Rousseau's exaltation of citizenship as quintessentially unliberal. Now, we who are citizens of liberal democracy see nothing strange in regarding ourselves as such. We certainly don't see the two as incompatible terms. We see our citizenships, sometimes in more than one country. I myself am a citizen of two, and one of my sons is actually a citizen of three, as among our multiple identities as members of liberal democratic societies. This is in keeping um, with various earlier liberal teachings on these questions. In some sense, it also resembles Aristotle's, which presents the good man as a good citizen, but also as more and other than a good citizen, as Professor Collins discussed. Neither thinker presents our civic identity as subsuming all others. For Rousseau, by contrast, the citizen is just that, a citizen first, last, and always. Like all his fellows, he is bound by the general will in which each equally participates and to which each is equally subject. Unlike Rousseau's reconstruction of natural or original man, who is free and equal because he had nothing to do with his fellows, the citizen is free and equal because he has everything to do with them, because he is, as we would say, completely socialized. Rousseau's argument for the society of the general will is that only such a society adequately protects the freedom and equality of its members. Human beings in society are necessarily dependent on each other. The relevant question then is that of the terms of their dependency. In societies other than that of the general will, the members are dependent on various private wills, the worst form of bondage for human beings. Hence Rousseau's famous line from the social contract, and those who think themselves masters are no less slaves for that. The citizen, by contrast, is dependent on the general will only. He is free in the only sense in which human beings can be free in society, equally participating in sovereignty, equally subject to its decisions. So while free, the citizen is not an individual, liberal or otherwise. Rousseau differs, uh, I'm sorry, he. He, the Rousseauian citizen, differs fundamentally from his liberal counterpart 
in looking always to the whole community of which he conceives himself as wholly a part. He is not Publius, who happens to be a Roman among other things. He is Publius the Roman, that Roman who happens to be Publius. He identifies with Rome as the source of his being and with other Romans as his brothers and sisters. He lives to celebrate the triumphs of the city and to avenge insults and harm to it. Were he not himself so thoroughly a part of the city, we would say that he lives vicariously. The good citizen thus identifies his will with his city's collective will to its good as a city. It is this last that Rousseau calls the general will. It is the conformity of the citizen's particular will to the general will that defines the virtue of the citizen. Rousseau reinterprets civic virtue thus understood as virtue as such. In this as in so much else, he follows his great mentor Montesquieu, and in this as in so much else, though hardly ever naming him, Montesquieu follows Machiavelli. Plato and Aristotle certainly agreed that good citizenship required virtue, but they had not interpreted virtue, whether virtue as such or any one of the virtues, as identical with citizenship. They had not done so because virtue as they understood it, arete, pointed beyond the city in citizenship to the theoretical life, as Professor Collins mentioned, or to the life of the gentleman, which is also somehow above that of the citizen. For Rousseau and the moderns whom he followed, however, virtue was wholly subordinate to the interests of the city, hence the identification of it with unwavering citizenship. If virtue is subordinate to the city, then clearly the city is no longer conceived as subordinate to it. At what then does it aim? As mentioned above, at the freedom and equality of the citizens. The ends of Rousseauian society are thus identical with those of liberalism. He differs from the theorists of liberalism only as to the means necessary to accomplish them. Crucial, again, is universal subjection to the general will as the only basis of such freedom and equality as are available to man in society. From this, it necessarily follows that virtue be reinterpreted as conformity with this will and the political problem redefined as that of obtaining this conformity. This last is more easily preached than accomplished. Rousseau is nothing if not a moral realist. It is such realism that vindicates the unique authority of the general will, as its sway alone subjects no particular will to the mercy of other such wills. Yet by the same token, Rousseau must concede the natural weakness of the general will. While present in every individual and in every grouping within the city, it cedes in natural force to their more particular wills, individual and collective. By nature, the individual will prefer his interest to that of any group to which he belongs, and a smaller group will prefer its interest to that of the wider group of the city. Similarly, the city will prefer its interest to that of mankind in general, which will emerge as a problem for Rousseau. Given this natural disproportion between the force of the general will and those of the particular ones, citizens are not born but must be made. At this point in Rousseau's argument, its emphasis shifts in a manner that should delight students and teachers at this school. It shifts to the subject of leadership, which is the true function that Rousseau assigns to government and to political economy in its broadest sense. This is why his article entitled Political Economy, commissioned by his then friend Denis Diderot for the latter's celebrated encyclopedia, served as his principal work on both citizenship and leadership. For a variety of reasons, none of them good, this article remains woefully understudied today. It is nonetheless vintage Rousseau, and particularly appropriate to a curriculum such as yours, because it is not only Rousseau's lone work whose theme is the dyad citizenship slash leadership, but it's his only work which is explicitly addressed to leaders. Why must Rousseau's major work on citizenship be primarily addressed to leaders? Because Rousseau insists that citizenship will flourish only where capable leaders have left nothing undone to foster it. This may at first surprise us as seemingly contrary to the general tendency of Rousseau's political thought. His argument for the inalienable primacy of the general will in all matters of legislation tends not to expand but to limit the prerogatives of those who might previously have aspired to rule. They can now, 
pardon me, they can now do no more than govern, that is, execute the legislation passed by the people. Indeed, because there's a natural tendency of all human government toward encroachment, this following from the greater strength of the particular will versus the general, and therefore a natural tendency of all republics toward decay and eventual dissolution, citizens are called on to practice the utmost vigilance against the overreach of their chosen governors. Rousseau then agreed with Jefferson that eternal vigilance was the price of liberty and interpreted this principle <clears throat> even more rigorously than Jefferson. He proscribed, for example, all deputation of the legislative power to representatives on the grounds that such deputies inevitably became foxes guarding the hen house. As for the government reinterpreted as the executive, it was to be kept on a short leash. The very survival of a republic and hence of true citizenship is inevitably menaced by the very government necessary to its success. One necessary function of government, however, and even its primary function, is precisely <clears throat> the formation of citizens. For this is a matter of civic education in the broadest sense of the term, such that it pervades every aspect of life in a well-ordered republic. The education is, this education is necessarily a mandate of the government. Rousseau's discussion of civic education evokes a world known to his readers from ancient books, but foreign to their personal experience, sorry, but foreign to their personal experience as subjects of monarchies. It is a world in which all other attachments and their objects are pruned to facilitate patriotism, which is to say that the society depicted is one of sublime austerity. It is a world in which love of the fatherland, l'amour de la patrie, is fostered from the cradle and subsumes or preempts all other attachments, whether more particular or more general. Rousseau's teaching on citizenship thus culminates in one of his many paradoxes. On the one hand, nothing can restrain government but an active and vigilant citizenry. On the other, nothing can maintain such a citizenry but an active and indeed proactive government. In order for government to be kept small in the crucial respect, namely that it be denied the usurpation of the legislative power toward which it naturally tends, it must prove ubiquitous in this respect. It must stand firm and triumph as its own, as its own only effective adversary. Nothing stands in the way of the magistrate's usurpation of the legislative power, but the determined opposition of the citizenry, whose spine they are charged with stiffening. Rousseau's scrupulous realism concerning the relationship between a citizenry and its government necessarily culminates in the paradox that every government poses a threat to its citizens, which the citizens can successfully resist only if rigorously educated by their government to do so. I'll end with some final comments on the tension between citizenship and liberalism. Citizenship in Rousseau's strong sense depends on many conditions, absent alike from the budding re liberal regimes of his day and the developed ones of ours. It requires societies that are small, agrarian, homogeneous, prosperous but not affluent, and in which the distribution of wealth is relatively equal. It also requires a civil religion whose compatibility with Christianity or any other universalist, universalistic monotheism is at best uncertain. While these conditions of citizenship are insufficient, they are all necessary. Since such emerging liberal societies as England and Holland failed to meet them, they could learn no more from Rousseau's treatment of citizenship than regret that it was no longer an option for them. As for the civic transformation of a corrupt and decadent monarchy like France, don't even think about it. Rousseau had some slight hopes for such backward European nations as Corsica and Poland. But his reputation as a revolutionary, the consequence of his posthumous adoption by the Jacobins, obscures that his primary intention in promoting citizenship was probably a conservative one. He sought to reinforce or reinvigorate it in the few places where it already existed, or perhaps we might say where it still existed, notably his native Geneva and the other Swiss republics. Rousseau, like Marx, who owes so much to him, has always posed a problem for defenders of liberal democracy. 
This is because he shares its goal, again, combining equality and freedom, while offering such a radical critique of its shortcomings in achieving this goal. To hear him tell it, the liberal versions of equality and freedom are shadows without substance, concealing a grim reality of inequality and servitude. What liberal democracy celebrates is citizenship, voting, for example, is equally defective by his oh-so-rigorous standards. Yet precisely because Rousseau's standards are so rigorous, he discourages liberal reformism or any other version of gradualism. What then does Rousseau encourage for those condemned to live in a society that he deems so irremediably defective? The answer is to be found not in his political writings, properly speaking, but in his Emile or on education. Emile, the fictional pupil of the work, will learn about citizenship. Indeed, he will learn the outline of the argument of the social contract, first published in book five of Emile, a year before its publication um, in its own right under the title that has become famous. Yet, Emile will read it not with an eye to practicing citizenship, but rather to learn to resign himself to its absence from the world that he knows. Subsequently, he will tour Europe with his tutor Jean-Jacques, yes, a fictionalization of Rousseau himself, in order to decide where to choose to live. Oddly, they omit visiting the Swiss republics, where alone in Europe, Emile could have observed a reasonable facsimile of citizenship. In light of this omission, it is unsurprising that Emile chooses to remain in France <clears throat> on the premise that there's no place like home. Citizenship being impossible for him in a country where there is none, he will keep to his beloved Sophie and their children while practicing random acts of kindness. The blatant inequality and other injustices of the Asia regime will offer him ample opportunity for these. Would such be Rousseau's recommendation to us as well? We can only speculate as to what he would have made of actual liberal democracies, to say nothing of a large technologically advanced one like ours. There was, however, at least one careful reader of Rousseau who, unlike him, was able to observe a working liberal democracy. That was Alexis de Tocqueville. Those passages of Tocqueville most critical of democratic life bear more than a family resemblance to Rousseau's critique of the, critique of the emerging liberalism. At the same time, Tocqueville, writing in the shadow of the French Revolution and the cataclysmic rise and fall of Napoleon, shows himself a better friend of moderation than Rousseau. Lowering his standards for citizenship accordingly, he finds it in the township, in the jury system, in Americans' flair for voluntary association, in their mutual helpfulness, and in a raucous patriotism that enlivened American life even if it did not ennoble it. Tocqueville, like any short-term visitor, saw some things about the host society and missed others. Yet he clearly showed that one could view liberal democracy through a largely Rousseauian lens and still discern a species, a species of citizenship. Thank you. I received a question um, on paper um, from Ray Burks, is that correct? Uh, okay, thank you. Um, as Susan spoke, he kept hearing the lives of Vincent van Gogh and Ludwig uh, von Beethoven. To think of them pursuing the common good or citizenship is almost absurd. How might the panel's view allow for or incorporate these extreme individuals or even immense human assets. I don't know which of you wants to take that one on first. So this, um, it's often, students will often ask with respect to Aristotle, so I'll stick with what I know, um, why the artistic life is absent from the account of the best possible lives. And the harsh answer to that is that the, uh, it could be, I think it's a puzzle that it's absent, but, um, and I'd have many other things to say than what I'm about to say in the interest of time. The harsh um, answer to that m may be that Aristotle would place the artistic life under the life of pleasure. Um, and that there's a, a, low, a low form of pleasure and a high form of pleasure and it might it might 
uh, constitute a very high form of pleasure in terms of the kinds of artistic activities that are um, involved, but that it would nonetheless still not be a contender for the best way of life, the political way of life and the philosophic way of life. The, and, and that's because of the virtues that are involved in these two ways of life. Um, the only other thing I would say about that briefly is that Aristotle is attempting to work through this question of the relationship of thought and action and the, the competition of the two ways of life, political and philosophic, are um, the path of inquiry that he takes in order to try to think through that question. Um, and that would take a much longer uh, account to try to make clear why those two ways of life are the two ways of life that he says are the contenders for the best way of life. I say, Rita, it seems to me that the kinds of people you're talking about find a home more readily in the liberal citizenly world than any of the others that we've talked about. Um, although, I mean, it's interesting because you mentioned Beethoven. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about his biography, but I believe he was a serious, uh, politically interested, very seriously politically interested, um, a great fan of the revolutionary m movements of his time, and uh, committed to the what I think he thought was the public good of his community as uh, those revolutions unfolded. Van Gogh, I don't really know much about what he what he did politically, if anything at all. Um, but I think. Uh, I think the liberal regime would have room for them, although it would require, let's say, if there was a war and they were drafted, they'd be expected to go off to war. That would be the one thing. But otherwise, liberal society would leave them free to pursue their art as they, as they wished. Um, geniuses may not be public-spirited, but they can be. And I'd cite the example of Rousseau himself. He was a genius, an artist, a bohemian. He was a teenage runaway who spent most of his, much of his early life homeless. Um, he was never happy or comfortable in any society, but he strove to be a loyal citizen to Geneva in a way that only a genius could be, and strove to be loyal to the cause of mankind as he understood it, as only a genius could be. And I too would second Michael's remark, for better or for worse, and it's very often been for worse, in modernity geniuses have very often felt affinities for various political ideologies, to many of which some of them have, in fact, ended up sacrificing their genius. I don't know whether I'm, I feel as a citizen uh, of Scowl, I'm bound to the rule that two students should be able to ask questions <laughs> first. Yeah, thank you all. I really enjoyed uh, the panel. So I have a question about uh, Locke on duty. Um, and so, uh, from what I understood, uh, Aristotle has this idea that the individual uh, is in a state of potentiality when he is not in the community. And when he is in the community, he, uh, it is only then that the good of the ideal city can be achieved um, and the good of the individual, both of which are happiness. Um, but for Locke, the individual is in a state of completion in the state of nature and it is from there that the society is not created by function, like for Aristotle, but um, by a convenience to protect uh, these natural rights. So my question was, is there, uh, for Aristotle, if there's this account of moral responsibility that is closely in line with human function, is there something like that that uh, Locke gives about moral responsibility coming out of these rights? Well, there, I'm, I'm not sure I actually fully understand your question, but um, certainly, Lo uh, it's, so if the latter part of your question, does Locke understand moral responsibility to come out of rights? Well, the answer is uh, yes. There are, two, there are at least two kinds of moral responsibility that Locke uh, recognizes as related to rights. First, person X's rights impose moral responsibilities on person Y. That is, you have a right to your life, um, integrity of your body, and therefore person, uh, no person has a right to impose on your body, intrude on your body, uh, or to coerce you, in effect, the point I was making in my talk. Um, and therefore, all those other persons have responsibilities or duties not to harm you. So that's, that's, that's one point. The second is that is, as a matter of... Um, um, 
human beings go on. I didn't talk about this so much in my talk, but it was implicit in it. There, as Locke says, without without government, uh, human life turns out to be miserable. So the, in, in a way, the whole point of Locke's philosophy is to ask, why is it that we need this institution that exercises coercive authority? Why do we need coercion in life? And he tries to give an account of what it is, what life would be without coercion. And the fact is, it tends to degenerate into a situation in which there's a lot of injustice and harm to others that's done for a variety of re reasons that he goes into. Um, uh, and so we, we, we human beings, he, as he talks about it, and uh, it, again, it's more of a model than a uh, historical treatment, we make a social contract in which we agree to have certain kind of uh, rules and authorities to govern us, and that we, um, uh, in effect, promise ourselves and, and others that we will obey those authorities. Uh, and from those promises derive uh, obligations, uh, duties, and responsibilities towards the community and towards other, in well, we already have responsibilities to our, towards other individuals as rights bearers, but we have duties to the community via the social contract. But, but could I just pick up on an aspect of this question to pose to you, uh, Michael, with respect to this? Because it, I thought uh, an aspect of the question was, in the Aristotelian account, human beings find their completion in the activities of citizenship. And is there in your lock room for that kind of account that we would only come to our sort of full functions as human beings in the, in the activities of citizenship itself? I mean, I made that more problematic yeah. by suggesting that we have to make sense of Aristotle's right. account of the right. two ways of life. Right. Well, I think in this regard, uh, Locke has a much more, let's say, open-ended view about human possibility. I'd like to make a distinction that may or may not make sense to most people between possibility and potentiality. The potentiality is uh, uh, a range of options, uh, not so much a range of options, but an option uh, that is the full, that is contained within the, the, I'm not giving a very clear account of this, but um, good example, I, an example I like to use is the, uh, the an acorn has the potential to become an oak. That's, that's sort of built into what an acorn is. It can become an oak. That's a potential of the oak. The oak has the possibility of becoming a desk. That is, it can be made into a desk, but that is not a natural growth of the oak into a desk. And so I'd say one, the one is a potential and the other is a possibility. And I think Locke thinks about human beings for the most part in terms of possibilities. They have they have powers, as he calls them. They have powers, but they don't have like a one defined set uh, end point of those powers. Uh, so they have possibilities. And I think for Locke, the society is absolutely necessary for us to develop our possibilities, not so much our potentialities in the sense I'm using that term, uh, but to develop our possibilities. So uh, Locke, contrary to what a lot of people like my colleague Patrick Janine would think, um, it seems to see that the inter interrelations of people in society, he has this very wonderful set of passages about the division of labor and about how human beings are interconnected through the division of labor, and that human beings are mutually dependent on each other, and that it's in, the de it's in that dependence that their possibilities actually emerge. I like to think of the question of what happened to all the people who have the capacity who have, have the capacity to become fantastic computer programmers. What did they do before there were computers? So the, 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 possibil the things that we invent and do m open up possibilities for human beings that didn't exist before. And that's what makes um, uh, Locke a kind of, um, how should we say, certainly progressive and certainly um, progressive in that particular sense. Um, for Locke, progressivism did not mean dis redistribution of wealth, uh, which it seems to me more or less mean now. Um, but uh, uh, to see the development, the further development of human society as in principle and possibility a great gain for humanity. Oh, sorry. Um, Thank you so much for, for this discussion. I, I was going to ask our Locke presenter and Rousseau presenter uh, both um, what um, Michael thinks of Rousseau's account of citizenship and 
vice versa. <laughs> you want to go over? Well, what, 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 what do you think of Locke's account of citizenship, the strengths and weaknesses, and what does Michael think of Rousseau's? That is a really tough question, <laughs> especially to, 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 to give a brief answer. Um, I'm obviously, um, I'm, I'm highly sympathetic to liberal democracy. On the other hand, I think that liberal democracy flourishes best when it takes some note um, of criticisms leveled against it, which are not entirely hostile criticisms. I say this because Rousseau does share liberal democracy's goals of freedom and equality, and therefore, in a way, his criticism of it is friendly criticism, right? however, however harsh that criticism may seem. And um, it seems to me that Rousseau was on to something in founding the modern left as he did. In a way, Rousseau is the founder of the notion, I think, that it's actually society more than the state that's the crucial element, politically speaking. And he thought that liberal thinking was an abstraction in not recognizing that the inequalities that liberalism still tolerated, or which it in fact fostered you know, through the vast expansion of commercial wealth, that these inequalities had um, extraordinary um, implications for politics, right? which tended to overshadow um, all merely formal institutions or categories of politics. So to that extent, you know, I think that Rousseau's criticism of um, liberal, the liberal notion of citizenship is powerful. On the other hand, you know, Rousseau never had seen, according to Rousseau, there could not be a working liberal democracy, right? And the, the striking thing about leftist criticisms of Rousseau is they go on to say, well, there isn't, <laughs> right? They take Rousseau's critique and apply it to liberal democracy and find it wanting in the same way that Rousseau found the Ancien Regime and incipient liberalism wanting. And, um, you know, I'm not entirely sympathetic to such criticisms, but I'm, you know, I'm not entirely unsympathetic to them either. Um, it does make a difference, right, when you have a vastly greater degree of social inequality. Um, I've lived, I've actually sp spent a, a lot of time recently, for various reasons which I won't go into, in Finland, um, a liberal democracy that has a much flatter, you know, distribution of income than the United States, and it is a very different society for that reason. Um, I, th I think I could, I could answer, on behalf of Locke, I could answer this, I think, fairly quickly. Uh, it, when uh, Cliff presented um, his account of Rousseau's notion of citizenship and talked about Rousseau seeking the complete socialization of, of man, I, I think that's where Locke would say, I'm getting off this train. Um, one, he doesn't think the complete socialization of man is possible and that you'll commit great crimes attempting to achieve it, as I think has happened in world history. Uh, and the second, I think he would say it isn't necessarily, it isn't a, a, a desirable outcome even if it were possible. Uh, Locke is very impressed with the individual character, that is, that is that human beings are different from each other and therefore to make them all into one cookie cutter pattern isn't really uh, helpful for uh, human development. So um, he, I, I think one of the things he's trying to do is both political authority, that is the authority to make a society so socialized or coherent in some sense, he wants to put that on strong footing but he also wants to draw the limits to it that um, the state or the s political authorities have a certain proper sphere of action, but the rest of it should, a lot of the rest of, the rest of it should be left to human individuals to pursue uh, what to them seems, as you know, as Jefferson wrote into the Declaration of Independence, a right to the pursuit of happiness. We should have a right to pursue happiness as we see it, and we each, we do tend to see it somewhat differently. So long as we respect the needs of society, I mean, Rousseau, one can over, way overstate um, what, uh, uh, how much in, uh, individual pursuit of happiness uh, Locke, for example, would uh, uh, validate. So there are, you know, you have to obey the law, you have to respect other people's rights, you have to be concerned about the public good, all of these kinds of things are, are things Locke affirms. That's it. Do we have time for another question? Oh, okay. Um, Clifford, thank you for sharing with us um, that you have dual citizenship. And my question is about that, um, the fact that 
you know, when I talk to people who have dual citizenship, just like me, um, they don't have clear differentiation between uh, when or where is the fine line to get involved in politics or not. Uh, when I talk to people, hey, did you vote or you're going to vote? And it's like, oh, well, I don't know. There's a lot of politics in America and I am not familiar with the 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 basics of that politics so i'm not going to get involved so i end up not going to vote so i guess my question do, do we can can the research actually show us that distinguish in terms of you know uh willingness to or behavior related uh, uh to make such decision i want to be involved or not being involved and why um i don't know what the research shows um, I can only speak on the basis of my own experience. Um, it took us 20 years to decide to become Canadian citizens. Uh, we had particular reasons for making the decision when we did. It was only after becoming a Canadian citizen that I started writing for Canadian newspapers, which has been my chief form of participation in Canadian politics, though more often than not I write about American politics, trying to explain the United States to Canadian readers. Um, for me, it was liberating to become a Canadian citizen in that it, it did um, enable me you know, to participate in Canadian life in a way that I had not done so previously. I was actually encouraged by a US immigration official to become a Canadian citizen. Once I was entering the United States, he said, hey, he said, you've lived in Canada for a long time. Why haven't you become a citizen? <laughs> Evidently, it had become American policy to encourage Americans resident in the United States to adopt Canadian citizenship, presumably on the premise that you then have more Canadian citizens friendly to the United States. That might not have been a correct premise, <laughs> since so many of my former American colleagues, right, are not particularly friendly to the United States, and that's one of the reasons why they're in Canada. seem to have a couple minutes, so I'm going to try to ask this as briefly as possible, and I don't know if it will be outside of your remit, but um, Professor Collins and Professor Orwin, as you were speaking, you kept using phrases sort of in the case of Aristotle, um, the, the sort of good of the community, service to the community over individual good. Um, Professor Orwin, um, I think the, the sort of idea that duties to the community result from the social contract or service to the community um, are maybe sort of central to the social or civic contract. Um, and I was struck by the fact that in America today, the people who, to whom we sort of, or with whom we think of that vocabulary, right, people who do community service are actually people who have broken the social contract. To everybody else who's doing service to the community, we call it volunteering, right? Um, and it got me thinking about the degree to which maybe um, the vocabulary has actually sort of fed into a particular mindset whereby service to the community is no longer part of the individual's sort of responsibility to the social contract. Um, and sort of, I guess I'm just interested maybe in, in your thoughts, if you have any, as to whether that is maybe um, a, a change in vocabulary that's irrevocable, um, or if it's sort of an, a sort of recasting of those ideas in a new vocabulary that might be a way of sort of rethinking or reapproaching the idea of what it means to be a sort of member of a society or a civically responsible person. Can I ask quickly, uh, just to say, if you would say a little bit more about why you see this distinction between volunteering and the breaking of the social contract? Well, not volunteering, but that the fact that we use the phrase community service, right. usually in the context of sort of punishment, right? Um, where, like, it's, it's if you've broken the social contract, how do you repair it? How are you brought back in, right? You do service to the community. Whereas people who do it voluntarily um, are called volunteers, right? And the sort of the vocabulary of community service is set aside, is siloed away from that. Or at least that just casually seemed to occur to me. Yeah, uh, there's a lot there, actually, now that I see the genesis of the question. Um, I mean, because in the first case, it, it seems to me that when we ask people to do communities, who've broken the social contract to do community service, we are, in fact, trying to reinvigorate their citizenship by bringing them back into the, the, the civic community by doing this kind of work. I'm not sure about the second case, that the, the language is interesting, that we would make this distinction between volunteering and your civic activity, because I would say 
that kind of volunteer work. My mother was uh, um, the manager of Volunteer Action Center. And uh, I, I always liked that, the Volunteer Action Center. And one of the things that they did, though, was to help staff with volunteers various civic and public agencies. And it seemed to me that that was of a piece with their with civic activity. So even though we're using this different language, and I, I'm kind of thinking about why, why you're right, why do we use this different language? Maybe because we privatize so much of our lives, we obscure the fact that actually this kind of activity is, is deeply civic and, and, and critical in its way. You know, we should recognize it as critical to the civic good. So that would be my, my brief answer. Cliff probably has a better answer. <laughs> No. <laughs> I mean, I hadn't thought about it, but it is unfortunate that community service is now the name of a punishment. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a very unfortunate development. Interestingly, Rousseau takes the view that in a healthy society, you would have not only a very high level of civic participation in the sense of political participation, but, but that you would have all kinds of informal activities. And in fact, this is a, a side of Tocqueville that may well have been influenced by Rousseau. Because in the case of Geneva especially, Rousseau presents these voluntary, usually local neighborhood um, clubs of various kinds as, as one of the major seedbeds of citizenship in the political sense. Can I just ask, is it, um, is this thing working? Um, it, oh, is that, yeah, yeah, I don't blame him. Um, I, maybe I'm misremembering, but I, you know, recently taught for a number of years at Notre Dame, and one of the things that Notre Dame students are very active involved in is, in fact, I think they call it community service, and it's not just the name of a punishment there, it's the name of voluntary, uh, just voluntary activity, uh, do, doing good things in the community, and isn't it called community service there? Zach, you were nodding. But, uh, well, anyway, I, yeah, I'm, I'm just not sure that that uh, um, that the terminology is quite as as uh, sh shifted in the way that we've been discussing. Well, please uh, join me in thanking Catherine and this panel.